You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. And man, oh man, what a mess. Uh, this is a truly, uh, you know, a, a black swan event we are living through right now. Um, and frankly, even those who predicted a, a recession, they could have no idea how badly the global economy could be crippled in just a few weeks from literally this sucker punch of a virus, right? This idea that something would come out of the blue and take a perfectly healthy economy and all of a sudden make it so that no one could leave their house. No one could work. Employers uh, would go out of business because no one came because people are at home. Uh, people can pay debt. I mean, this is an event of really unparalleled, uh, you know, uh, impact. And um, I think, uh, you know, hopefully it'll be short lived. Hopefully it will be. But I do think that those people who anticipate this being over in April, it ain't going to be over in April. It ain't. It ain't going to happen. Uh, you know, the, the good news is that there are apparently a number of drugs in the pipeline that seem to be doing pretty well. And uh, in South Korea, uh, seem to be doing pretty well. And some of the other cases in Asia, around Asia, the cases in China are down. Now, in our case, things are only going to get worse for a while. And um, make no mistake about it, that even if, you know, it's just a couple of months of people staying at home and not buying anything, that will have extraordinary repercussions. The fiscal and monetary tools that we have, that we've had, you know, created for ourselves in, in the United States to combat this type of situation, well, there is none, right? They're not designed for this kind of assault. Cutting interest rates, quantitative easing, honestly, completely meaningless if businesses are closed, no one's buying anything. Uh, cutting payroll taxes, that does not help when nobody's at work, right? If there's no payroll, how can you think that payroll tax cuts are going to help at all? Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, 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 I don't know exactly how you pronounce it, but uh, he has suggested that if nothing is done, there could be 20% unemployment, 20%, which is really, really remarkable. Um, now, compare, I mean, that's really great depression levels, right? Now, do I think that's going to happen? Gosh, I hope not. Um, but I do know that a big fiscal stimulus is coming soon, and we'll just have to see what it does. But real in reality, until people can get out of their houses and buy stuff, until people can work and employers can pay their employees and people can pay rent, uh, gosh, there you know, there's not a whole lot you can do. So, wouldn't it be nice in this environment not to have to worry uh, about your investments at all? I mean. Really? I mean, is that even possible? Well, suppose there was a financial instrument that's been around for 1,400 years, used by some of the wealthiest families in the world for generations, and it was used to create and preserve wealth. You know, suppose that that product survived the test of the Great Depression, became the favorite financial instrument for those who lived through the Great Depression because it continuously paid a positive interest every year while everything else crumbled around them and was actually, you know, something that they could access when they needed it as a source of liquidity and didn't fail them. Wouldn't that sound appealing right about now? Well, this, this investment, it's even better than that because it grows untaxed. Its liquidity can be harnessed, as I mentioned, and it can be harnessed really in any credit condition, right? You don't have to rely on the banks. In fact, it is a product that literally allows you to invest the same money in two places at the same time. Crazy, right? But we're going to get into that. So my, in my opinion, and it really is, I have to tell you, this is my opinion, but I truly believe that this is the safest investment 
option outside of U.S. Treasuries. And, you know, U.S. Treasuries don't pay very much. And frankly, this is an option, in my opinion, that's safer than any corporate bond that I could buy and way more profitable. Simply put, I don't understand. I really don't understand why it's not part of everyone's portfolio who knows about it. Because to me, it's that much of a no-brainer. I'm, I'm talking about permanent cash value life insurance. And um, you know specifically, what we're going to talk about are these strategies that we've been hammering over and over, Wealth Formula Banking, Velocity Plus. And if you don't know how these strategies work or what they can do for you, I highly suggest you listen to this week's podcast because I can honestly say that if you have learned and implemented one of these strategies, you know, really, honestly, that's if that's all you did from listening to my podcast and that's something you didn't know about before, I would feel like that I have done something for you and for your family that is of great service. Now, that may sound like an exaggeration, but I use these tools myself and the way the market is right now, I couldn't be happier that I made that decision and frankly, kind of wish I'd done even more. So anyway, do yourself a favor, listen to this podcast interview with Christian Allen and Rod Zabriskie when we come back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Um, I'm glad to have uh, back on the show uh, Christian uh, Allen and Rod Zabriskie. As you know, they are our uh our insurance specialists, basically, for, our, for permanent life insurance, um, specifically these products that we call Wealth Formula Banking and Velocity Plus. I want to. Uh, I wanted to have them on because I feel like this is almost a little bit of an emergency type situation where, like, listen, um, a lot of you are wondering, well, gosh, what do I do right now? What do I invest in? What do I, you know? Um, you know, do I, do I wait for volatility and wait till there's, you know, distressed assets? Well, there, there is that, but there's also something that I think is really important and, and probably, um, right now is the best illustration of exactly why this product has the value that it has. Um, so I want to start from the beginning here. Let's take a step back. And talk about, you know, first of all, guys, welcome to the show. Sorry, I forgot to even say that. <laughs> well, we've I'm, been here a couple of times, but thanks for having us back. We're yeah, always uh, happy to be here. But I'm all, you know, worked Back-up up and thinking about what's going on here. And yeah. um, pretty crazy time. Yeah, no kidding. So let's take a step back. Um, the first thing I want to uh, just remind people who are sort of un- maybe unfamiliar with what we're going to be talking about here is what we're talking about is, um, you know, uh, a type of life insurance. Um, you know, most people think of life insurance uh, as, you know, just that, you know, in case you die, your loved ones are protected and uh, and all that. And I think a lot of people have no idea uh, when we what we're talking about when we refer to life insurance uh, as a potential investment vehicle. Um, so first, uh, do you want to just comment on that? Uh, you know, term term insurance, what we're used to, life uh, permanent uh, life insurance. What's the difference? Uh, and then you know, feel free to use in whatever context, historical, whatever you want. But why don't you start with that? Sure. So I think. I think the first challenge that ends up coming in people's mind when they think of life insurance um, as a vehicle for accumulating rather than just as like term insurance is, <clears throat> is not understanding the difference between the two. So the first thing, there's basically three types of life insurance. You have your term insurance, which is just simple, simple and straightforward. It's like any other type of insurance. You pay the premium. If you die during that time frame, the beneficiaries are paid out, whatever that death claim is, right? So really simple, straightforward. As long as the policy is enforced, it pays the, the claim with few exceptions. Um, and, then, and then in the 19, about 1980s, uh, well, I guess I should step back. Term insurance existed for a long time. Whole life insurance existed even longer. Whole life insurance is kind of like the dinosaur of life insurance policies, right? It's the place that people go because they know what they want to get. They know um, that it's really super safe. It's predictable. And it's just going to kind of plug along and do its thing. Now, we'll talk about how we use that in a minute. 
Were you going to say something? No. Okay. So we'll talk about how we use that in just a second. Um, but just from a, from a contextual standpoint, term insurance is simple insurance in and of itself. Whole life insurance is kind of the dinosaur. It does build up cash value. So a portion of the premium that we put into it goes toward um, what they call the cash value. The other portion goes toward paying for the death benefit. Um, so, and like I say, we'll get into that here in just a minute. And then in the 1980s, a third type of uh, policy was created. And if you remember the 80s, right, it was booming interest rate time. And so, you know, being in a life insurance policy, a whole life policy that was getting, uh, you know, 7 or 8% interest and dividend in comparison with, you know, the CDs that suddenly started to creep up and go with, you know, 10, 12%, uh, basically the life insurance industry came in and said, hey, we're going to create this new policy that kind of create that, that kind of brings the, the combination of term insurance and whole life into one, creates more flexibility, allows it to be a death benefit for your entire life. The, the challenge that we ended up having, and, and this is and why. Just for context, what is that called? Yeah. What is that um, one called? Just universal life. Sorry, yeah. I don't know if I clarified that. Right. So universal life. Now we have whole life, term, and, and universal life that's sticking inside of that. And we'll get into the, the various forms in a minute. But, but the, the important thing on this is just to know that um, it's basically a combination of term and, per, and whole life. And the idea was to put as little money in, in the life insurance policy as possible to get the most death benefit. Now, that became a real problem when interest rates suddenly declined, right? So if I went into one of these policies and said, hey, I want to pay as little as I can, and I, I know I'm going to get 10%, at least that's what people thought then putting as little as they could was, was a great idea at the time or it, it seemed and the life insurance industry didn't help much. Um, but they learned over time that as interest rates came into play, that that could be a challenge. And so for that reason, I think that there was some, the life insurance industry specifically around universal life kind of got a black mark um, from a historical standpoint because there probably needed to be more regulation. Uh, anyway, that's kind of a back, you know, getting to the very basics of what those three types of products do and, uh, hopefully that's kind of a helpful context for your listeners. Yeah. So let's let's put all of this um, uh, now. The in basically we're going to leave term behind because term is is like paying rent, right? Instead of owning an asset, you're renting an asset. You're basically saying um, I'm going to borrow. I'm going to I'm going to pay you for a certain period of time, uh, and you know uh, this thing will protect me until I'm sixty some years old, and if I don't die by then, it's going to go away, and all that money I spent. It isn't going to go towards building an asset at all. Permanent life insurance is the other side, which you basically have talked about in the context of whole life insurance. Um, there was this uh, back in the 80s, you, you talk about this uh, universal, which we're not going to talk about because basically we're not going to go into much of it, but it wasn't a good idea for all the reasons that Christian said. So now we're going to stick with initially two concepts. One, um, well, we're going to stick with one main concept, and that is permanent life insurance. So specifically, when we talk about whole, what exactly is whole life insurance? Um, you know, how does it work? Uh, you know, I, what I have learned, and I'm asking questions that, you know, I kind of know the answer to, in part just to make this educational, but what I have come to, under, to realize and understand is that um, the way things work with whole life insurance, it could arguably, again, in my opinion, from what I've seen, be called the safest possible investment, uh, especially when you consider the risk adjustment uh, with potentially the exception of the U.S. Treasuries, although you know, the, the return on that is terrible, whereas here you're talking about quite a bit more return. Do you agree with that? And, um, you know, tell us how whole life works and, and, and all that. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say that what you're saying is true and, and really it comes back to the, the strength of the company. So uh, specifically when, when we're looking at a whole life policy, uh, we're not just, just picking any, any company out the street. We're, we're going to do, uh, we're going to vet them and only go with those companies that are around for a long, long time, more than a hundred, 150 years great ratings in terms of these independent rating companies like Moody's or S&P and, and have a great track record of paying a dividend. And so, uh, so to begin with, when we, when we narrow down to those companies, 
I agree. They are among the strongest companies uh, in the world because of a few things. Number one is they carry large amounts of reserves. Part of that's regulated, a part of that's just because of the nature of what they do. Like a 40-year-old who gets a policy, chances are they're going to live another you know, 40, 50, 60 years. And so the company has to be uh, prudent in the way they manage their finances because they're going to pay out this death benefit decades down the road. So the type of investments that they get involved with are very safe, uh, fixed type of stuff in, in bonds, right? Not just corporate, but, but government, um, but notes and long term, 30, 40, 50 year types of, of places where they're invested. And so, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this, but like with whole life, uh, it comes with a 4% guaranteed interest rate. And people say, well, how can they do that? Well, the, the way they can do that is because of these long-term, the long-term nature of it, right? If, if banks are offering next to nothing and, and continually dropping as we speak, um, how can a, an insurance company like that offer a guaranteed 4%? And, and that's the reason why. It's because they have these, you know, large, large reserves uh, that are invested and, and just receiving consistent so uh, is, return on it. <clears throat> so as you mentioned, bonds, uh you know, they, they, and they also own some of the, you know, the highest end, you know, real estate assets in the country. They barely use any leverage. So they're extremely conservative, but because they've had these assets, many of these assets for so long, they're cash flowing like crazy. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to, um, uh, point out here was that, you said 4%, but that's the contractual agreement. That doesn't even include dividends, right? And what is dividends right. usually that's like right. another, you know, 1.5% or yeah. so? Good question. So right now, depending on the company, then it could be another 1.5 to to 2, maybe a little more than 2 with a few of the companies. Okay. And so, but that's right now with, you know, with interest rates as, as low as they have been, it's actually historically low. Um, so if, if we ever get back to normal interest rates, you know, if, if uh, you know, on mortgage rig back up to six, 7%, then, then you'd expect the dividend rate to go up and may, it might put you a total with the guaranteed four plus the dividend more around, you know, seven or eight. And the other question I have for you is when we say the dividends themselves, we know that that contractual number that you said was 4% contractual, they have to pay that the the number on the dividends is variable, although even in extremely low rate environment, you know, maybe one, 1. 1.5, maybe even 2% on top of that. So we're talking about five and a half, six yeah. percent Has there been, for the companies that you're, that we deal with here, Penn Mutual, Mass Mutual, mm -hmm. how often do they not pay right. dividends? Well, uh, they don't miss a year. So I'll use Penn Mutual as an example. Uh, they were created in 1847. They paid their first dividend, dividend in 1849, and they have not missed a year since then. So rem remarkable, right? You think about it in their backyard, they had the Civil War going, you know, 15 years later after they formed, and they just kept plugging along and paying a dividend, right? So, so in Great Depression, World Wars. And that's exactly right, and that's what I'm trying to get at. 4% is the four percent is the contractual, then people say, well, yeah, but the rest of it's not guaranteed. Well, how much more guaranteed do you want than we've paid through the Civil War? We've paid through, you know, the Great Depression, multiple world wars, hyperinflation, <laughs> and now coronavirus, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, this is one of those truly, in my mind, and I, this is the way I use it, I use it as the safest possible investment I can have. Now, of course, you know, people are looking at those numbers and saying, you know, low interest environment and five and a half, six percent. Uh, you know, those are obviously tax free growth, right? And and it's exponential yep. growth, right? It's it's uh it's um compounded growth, in other words, not not exponential. And so that makes a huge difference over in a period of time. Now, one of the questions that a lot of people have, though, is they say, well, I've heard that this, you know, this kind of permanent insurance is, you know, not really a good kind of investment. I mean, that's what Dave Ramsey tells me. That's what Susie Orman tells me. Um, 
So what? I mean, why why do they say that then? So my take on this is there's probably three things, right? So first is is they're just talking to the masses. And I think there is a difference, right? So when you're giving general advice almost to nobody, then, you know, for certain people buying term insurance to protect their family um, as a death benefit play is critical and important, right? So we don't want to pull, pull away from the value of term insurance. Um, but ultimately, uh, when you're speaking to the masses, you're not necessarily hitting on the people that can use it in a, in different ways. So what we're going to talk about as we get into this conversation is using these, this vehicle in ways to actually um, significantly optimize or enhance the way that we grow wealth. So, so anyway, the first thing, the first reason I think is, is probably because they're talking to the masses. The second one um, is probably just a general lack of understanding, right? So when we do this, we have some specific parameters that we're working around we're going to make sure that in every single, every single um, policy that we create is going to be maximum funded for cash value and low cost. Um, that makes a massive difference. So a lot of people don't realize that there is uh, significant flexibility within the advisor's hands and how they want to create the policy. And strategically, for the purposes that we use it, every single situation is like that what ends up happening is they're talking and they're just saying like, okay, in general, if I buy whole life and it gets me two or 3% over a long time, that might be okay, but you might be able to do better somewhere else. The way we're doing it is different. And I think that's really uh, an important factor. Yeah. And, 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 and then, I wanted to just add to that, that a big part of what I'm trying to get at here is that here. So here's, let me tell you a little anecdote, which is I, when I finished residency and I started looking around and I didn't know anything about investing, um, the, there was, there were people who told me actually it was sort of the, you know, sort of the people who were sort of the know-it-all younger docs. They said, don't buy permanent life. Don't buy permanent life. And I was like, well, okay, fine. Just, you know, why? They said, well, you know, because your, your returns are not high enough. And they say, what they would say is, you know, buy term, and invest the difference is what they would say. In other words, don't spend the extra money on a whole, whole life or permanent life of any kind. But what was curious, though, is that as I continued to move up in, I guess, socioeconomic circles, the next thing I knew, the, the ultra-high net worth folks that I knew almost uniformly were using permanent insurance products. And I couldn't figure it out. I was like, wait a second. Why is it that the doctors back then told me to stay away from this stuff? And all of a sudden, these guys who are worth millions of dollars, a lot more than the doctors, they're all using some kind of insurance product. And the answer goes to, the answer ultimately was that you can't, you can't just say permanent life is good or permanent life is bad. It's like saying real estate is good or real estate is bad, right? Yeah, if you're going to buy, you know, D-class apartment building somewhere w with, you know, uh, with trouble keeping people in the apartment building and, you know, poor property management, that's not a good property, right? Whereas <laughs> if you right. have, you know, a top level operator who is focusing on a, you know, value add business plan is going to create growth there's a tremendous opportunity to make money, right? So that's the difference. Insurance is like anything else. It's how, it's a tool. Can I just say this, but this might be a good time. to Life insurance is an awful lot like real estate, right? Your listeners love real estate. Let me just mention a couple of ways that life insurance is very similar to real estate. So real estate is, life insurance is like real estate in basically three primary ways, right? One of them is that we build equity in it, just like we do in real estate. Number two is that it's, there's significant tax advantages, right? And, and we'll get into some of those even more in detail, but a lot of our high income, high net worth clients are using things strategically in conjunction with life insurance to maximize tax advantages. And then number three um, is leverage, right? And we're going to get into this concept of velocity plus and, and premium finance and and a lot of people that we talk to start to look at it like real estate in the sense that, well, if I could buy life insurance with leverage, 
why wouldn't I do it? I, I w most investors wouldn't even consider buying um, uh, an investment property with cash, right? Similarly, there's some really cool things that we can do with leverage and life insurance. So those three ways I think are a strong similarity between the two. And we all know, you know, we love, we love real estate. This can do a lot of the same things. So effectively the, the bottom line is, is that the reason that you've got some people like the Susie Ormans and the Dave Ramsey's, et cetera, saying that, you know, permanent insurance is not a good investment is because they are not using, they're not ex talking about the kinds of structured um, uh, insurance products that wealthy use. And so what That's we right. do is basically borrow from the concepts of the ultra wealthy. And we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about the Rothschild family. We're talking about the Romney. You know, we're talking about you know, people who have a lot of money. And so that's the myth that is broken. And we're going to talk about, you know, two of the main products, and then we'll touch on, you know, some of the higher net worth stuff in a, uh, next, because I think it'll give you an if idea. Can, go ahead. Yeah, if I can just uh, throw something next. So structure is one of them, and then purpose is another one. So just the whole reason why the Rothschilds have that policy, the way that they're using it, is very different than the, the audience that Dave Ramsey is talking to, right? right? It, when, when someone moves from that scenario of focusing on 401ks and market investing and those kinds of things, and they shift over to this world of cash flow investing and alternative investing, and you've seen this, right? You've seen a lot of people who make that shift. There's a fundamental difference in the way that they even just think about investing. Right. And this, this becomes a tool that can be used in the course of doing that, that they just wasn't even on their radar before they made that shift. Well, that's right. And ultimately this is, you know, whereas normally term insurance is insurance for the purpose of insurance and that's it. This is really an investment with the side benefit of insurance. Um, so, yeah, yeah, you know, Buck, I heard one of, I was listening to one of your podcasts earlier today with a guest, maybe just a few weeks ago. And one of the things that they said that I liked was that they like to deploy their dollars um, to do more than one thing at a time. And real estate does that, right? right? Life insurance does that. So the idea is, again, the wealthy people are generally becoming more sophisticated because they've had to come up with ways to, um, they've, had to they've had to learn how to solve problems. And so because of that, we've created, and not just us, but the industry has created opportunities to do things, especially for people like your high income listeners and your high net worth listeners um, that have tax needs. We can do, there's just all sorts of things we can do with it. So now we've established, okay, so this is a product, obviously wealthier looking at um, this is a product that has been potentially possibly the most robust and safest investment in my opinion over the last, you know, 140 years it is a product that, you know, people who lived through the depression, basically they had two things. They had life insurance, they had cash, they trusted nothing else. So let's talk a bit about now um, some more of the details here. The first type, we're going to talk about basically two of the main types that we really discuss. And one we call is the whole life product, which we call wealth formula banking. So you got to... Um, um, can you give us an example, basically, of how a wealth formula banking policy is structured? Uh, and let's just say we're using it, you know, just for pure growth. We're not even going to okay. use it for our creative stuff that we do. Then we can touch on that next. But how, how does it work? How do you create, how do you create, you know, an account that's growing money? And what does it look like over time? Yeah. So uh, really when, when we build a whole life policy, uh, there are different pieces we can put together to, to make it do what we want it to do. And that's at the discretion of the advisor. So in other words, uh, you may not get the same, even if you were asking for it, uh, you may not get the same policy from, you know, the guy down the street as what we can do because we just, we have that expertise and, and we know how to put them together. So essentially what we're doing, like Christian mentioned it earlier, we're going to maximize the cash growing capability of the policy. We do that by minimizing costs. 
which ironically reduces the amount of insurance as low as we can get it while still keeping all of the benefits that we're looking for. And over time, uh, even in an environment like now with the dividend rate is, is 6%, we can still generate a long-term uh, return on that policy of about 5% tax-free. And so again, you know, the listeners may say, ah, you know, 5%, even tax-free, that's not what, I, not what I'm looking for. But if you could, in uh, what they traditionally call the bond portion of your portfolio, if you could consistently, and again, even in an environment like right now where interest rates have been low for a long period of time and going lower uh, recently, then, you know, nobody would feel bad about that 5%. Again, tax-free, so the tax equivalent of that, you'd have to get, you know, depending on your tax per back at 7 8%, 9% to match that. Uh, in a in a taxable place, and so yeah. So it wasn't uh, that it's long been ago. Predictable. Sorry, Rod, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I, I was just thinking it wasn't that long ago we ran into a client, or I guess it was a prospective client at the time, who who was just bragging about how their whole life policy was the best investment they had ever made. Right now, again, um, you know, we're not expecting to go get twenty percent returns in here, but the fact is, is it's ultra safe. It's super consistent. We have the tax advantages, it's asset protected, like just a lot of really cool things to go with it. The, the, um, the other thing that I want to point out here is that, um, that I, that to me, here's how I see it. And I think, I think Rod hit on this. If you look at this purely from an overfunding standpoint, you're growing at five, five and a half percent compounding right now, even in a low interest environment, you have to look at that your comparison for there, for me, this is my quote unquote bond portfolio, right? Uh, bonds of this kind of, um, bonds of this kind of, uh, I think safety level are probably about one or 2% maybe right now, um, at best. Right. Yeah. And yep. so, so basically you're gotten a much higher return on it from the beginning. The other part is that you are creating an environment where the death benefit is something that is, you know, guaranteed, right? Over a period of time, if you just pay this for a period of time and you stop paying on it, uh, the, you know, you effectively have free, free life insurance. So in effect, you have guaranteed, you know, that you're leaving a legacy for your kids, which I think is really important, especially in times like now. I mean, think about, you know, I don't know, some people might be thinking, gosh, I mean, Look at what just happened to my stock portfolio. Well, if you have whole life, if you have permanent life, you are guaranteed, no matter how badly you screw up your portfolio, to leave money for your kids. I don't know about you, but that is important to me. So that's another thing I think about. Now, let's talk, up to now, it's not terribly sexy, okay? No, admittedly, and if it were just this, I probably wouldn't be as big a fan, but let's get into where we start using this wealth formula banking concept in a lot more creative ways. Okay. Because the real value of banking is its ability to become a source of liquidity that you can borrow from, but it's not like borrowing from your home equity line of credit. There is in fact a way to essentially double dip and essentially make money in two places at the same time. So guys, how does that work? And can you give us an example of using it, you know, in an example, say you used it as a down payment on a property instead of, you know, borrowed money, put it down as a down payment on, on a property. And what kind of, you know, compared to using money from a savings account, what kind of difference that could make in terms of your returns? So basically here, what we're talking about is using it as a source of leverage, right? And this is really important. Okay, so why don't you talk about first what do what do we mean by double dipping? Why is that important? And then give us an example if you can. Yeah, so as we as we fund this life insurance policy, we build up a cash value, and we can we can take loans against it. So in other words, what happens is is we're we're building up the the policy, we're earning that earn that guaranteed interest and dividend that we talked about earlier, and then. Uh, as we build that, we can actually loan against the cash value of the policy and go use that. In this case, we're talking about using it to go and, and invest in cash flow investments. So the fact is that that money in my in the policy and that cash value is going to grow and compound 
whether I loan against it or not. Okay, going back to your earlier point of it's a great place for safe growth and, and that kind of that's going to happen even if I loan against it. Right. Okay. So in this case, that, what that's I've done important. Is, that's important. Let me just say that once again, what you just said. If I've got a hundred thousand dollars of cash value and I borrow that cash value, I'm not borrowing it from my account. My money is continuing to grow at a compounding rate. Is that correct? That's right. Where yep. am I borrowing it from then? Yep. So, yeah, so the money that comes to you that you're using for the investing is actually coming from the general account of the insurance company. So we have two separate buckets of money. Your 100000 stays there. The, the investment money came from the general account. And so now that money's out and you've invested it in this property. That becomes the down payment uh, on, on the purchase of this property. And, and now it's working for you, right? It's generating some income. It's, you're going to get appreciation on the property. So it's creating value for you. And at the same time, the money that's, that is in the policy stays there and continues to grow and compound. Now a critical, critical point here, Rod, and I don't know if you mentioned it, the money that it, you have in your account is growing at a compounding rate. The money, when you borrow it from the general insurance account, you're borrowing at a simple interest rate. And if you don't know the difference between compounding rate and simple interest, put it in Google, you'll see what I mean. Because you can literally, theoretically, you could borrow at a higher rate of simple interest than you're getting as a compounding rate in your account and still come out ahead. In other words, if you borrowed at 5.5% simple interest and your account was only growing at 5% compounding, in short order, you're still going to come out ahead. I know it's a little tricky yeah. to think about it, but this is, a, this is a trick. This is a thing that people don't understand and one of the reasons why people don't utilize this. But the reality is there is a arbitrage between simple and compounding interest. You're borrowing at simple, your money's growing at compounding. Okay. So sorry to interrupt you. I just, it's so important that piece because that's why we call it double dipping your money. You borrowed it, you're deploying it somewhere else and you're still growing in your original account. That's why you're using the same money in two places at the same time. Okay. Rod, you give us an example of how a situation like, like that might work. Yeah, well, and you'd ask specifically about how to compare that to uh, using a savings account for that same kind of opportunity fund, right? So we meet a lot with a lot of people who are and have been investing in cash flow investments, and and they're just running the money through their their regular savings account, which is great, right? The reason they're doing that is because of the the safety of of keeping it there, and then the liquidity they they have access to it and they're ready for it. Well, if we can give you that same safety and access, but add on top of that some growth some tax benefit, some insurance that you don't have to pay for any other way. And, and now we add this other element of this, the arbitrage that we capture between simple versus compound. So you take that $100,000 uh, loan against the policy and you go and invest that and use it as a down payment against, you know, on this piece of real estate. Well, that $100,000 that's in your cash value acting as collateral continues to grow. Now, as you see cash flow coming off of that property, you're going to turn around and be funneling that back into the policy. Uh, that's paying uh, an, a form of interest right against the loan, and let, but then, like you said, that that becomes simple interest that you're paying. And if we were to amortize uh, the payback of that over, say, a 10-year period of time, then the by, by the time we get to the end of the 10 years where we've paid off that loan there's a significant difference between the amount of interest that you would have paid versus the amount of interest that you would have earned. And so um, we just can't undersell or oversell, or we can't oversell the, the value of that arbitrage. What, what does that end up? I mean, do you, I know you've done some diagrams before. I mean, can you give us some number advantages of <clears throat> what that might look like over a period of time? Like, yeah, so a I think the rate. one that we, yeah, I think the one that we have, uh, for example, in the webinar, we've done an example with uh, the 100000 and then a 20-year payback. And by the end of the 20 years, you would have paid about $65,000 of interest, but you would have earned about $165,000 of interest. Mm -hmm. So, again, I mean, 
understanding the concept of the difference between simple and compound is one thing, but then when you actually put numbers to it and you play it out over a period of time. So you basically came out about $100,000 a head? Yeah. In 20 right. years? On just that, print, yeah. that part alone. And that, yep. that webinar, by the way, is on wealthformulabanking.com. So, you know, I'll mention it again, but this is, and in that one, I don't even know if you used it. I think you might've even had it as a, a non-leveraged property. I'm not sure. But, and it's a yeah, we, we low amount on, on, it. on it, right? So the higher, the larger the policy, and, and then, of course, there's some, some assumptions we're making on the investments, but the larger that is, uh, as an example, we've shown out several different scenarios. And over time, for a lot of the investors that we work with, it'll literally be millions of dollars, right. um, depending on the size of the policy and how they use it. But it can be millions of dollars of difference and again, you're doing the same thing. You haven't even, you haven't done anything different um, other than put that money in the policy, borrow from there as your opportunity fund. Okay. So that one is uh, the double dipping. Wealth Formula Banking. I love this product. I have this product. It is my bond portfolio. And in times like these, it becomes an opportunity fund, right? You have cash value there and you know, you didn't let it sit in the bank getting like less than 1%. You've been growing at, you know, five, in my case, five and a half percent. And at any point I can go in there and reach in there and deploy that capital. And when I do, I'm double dipping. That's the value you're using. You know, you're using leverage, you're using velocity, all the things we normally talk about. Now I want to switch to something else, maybe m more for, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's a different kind of, uh, it's not the whole life type of thing. It is something that's different from what you initially talked about, universal life. Universal life as we know, we highly do not re recommend. First of all, start off talking about the difference between this product that we do not recommend, which was universal life versus yeah. indexed universal life. So one of the things that I think makes, um, makes us unique as an organization is that we're not really biased toward a product, right? At the end of the day, we want to create a strategy that wins for people. So when we get into this life insurance conversation, there is a big difference between traditional universal life that we've talked about, um, and index universal life, which we're going to talk about in more detail. The primary difference between the two is the the interest crediting rate. So we're going to talk about how to add leverage to the policy here in a sec, but from just a pure growth standpoint, the reason that we end up moving toward index universal life in conjunction with velocity plus and premium finance is because, um, we have a, we have opportunity for a greater arbitrage because of the way that they work. So maybe I should step back and go into that really quickly. Basically an index universal life credit, um, interest each year based on a view of the market. So in other words, they're going to mirror the market and say, okay, the market did 10%. And what they do is they create a cap and a floor. And so the idea is, and, and you've said this on your, on your show is that it's investing within the market with guardrails, right? right. So basically um, I don't have to experience the losses, but I can get up to a certain amount of gains. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that to another level, level when we leverage it. So typically in these kinds of things, when we're looking at that, you know, in other, so you put your money in the, the, the floor, 0%. In other words, you know, if the market loses money, you're not going to participate. Not a bad deal. The upside then in this is typically what? 12, 13%, something like that. Yeah, and it just depends on the product. We can go higher on the floor and lower on the cap or higher on the cap. So, yes, somewhere in the 12% range if you have a 0% floor and maybe it goes down if you decide to take a 1% floor. Just for, for perspective, if you had this policy right now, uh, you, 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 know, you wouldn't have lost money in the market. You would have just not gained it. Right. right. And wouldn't yeah, that and be wonderful people. right about now for people who are listening? Who, I mean, right. literally, I mean, we're doing this on the Wednesday, Wednesday before this is, uh, this is airing. Uh, the Dow is now dipped uh, into the low 19,000 range in a matter of a week from, or two weeks from the high. It's crazy. Yeah, it's incredible. So life insurance as a whole is a really gay, a really great non-correlated asset class, Right. right not correlated to the market. 
even inside of Index Universal Life, there's a strong non-correlation from the standpoint of no loss. Right. So, uh, yeah, that is critical. And, and obviously we have clients that have money in the market and, you know, we're not quite as, uh, anti-market as some people. And yet, uh, given the circumstances, certainly I would rather be inside of, a an index universal life policy, even if it wasn't leveraged, than uh, than than being in the market. So let's talk about this leverage aspect because now we said okay, zero was a floor, twelve thirteen was was the highest. Right away, I remember Tony in a Tony Robbins book I read about this years ago before I even um, you know before I met you guys before I really learned about this concept, and he just kind of kind of blazed over it. He said there was a type of account where you could take 12 or 13% of the upside. And if the market went below zero, you didn't have to participate. And I'm thinking, tell me more. Well, he never mentioned it again. And I bet you, I guarantee you people out there right now are saying, yeah, I remember that. I remember that part. I was totally interested in that. And he didn't mention again. That's what this is. Now, what's interesting about it is if you think about that idea, all right, zero and 13, that's not bad, but hey, what would we do in real estate if we knew that we had an upside and we didn't have a downside? Well, us real estate investors, we like to leverage things, right? Because we know if we have a cap rate of, you know, uh, and our cap rate is our gain. And in the context of the stock market, a 12 or 13% gain would be our cap rate for the year. If we can leverage that, we know that we could take a simple 7% in the market if it's a three to one leverage, that might turn out to 20% or so, right? So tell us exactly how that product works. Because now what I'm talking about is Velocity Plus, which is this indexed product cap floor with leverage. Yeah, great question. This is really an incredible strategy that we found a few years back. And part of the reason it's incredible is because um, it's so streamlined. But basically the way this works is that if I'm a high income earner, six figure earner, um, I can participate in this strategy, which ultimately tries to help us retain more of our capital, right? In essence, I want to buy life insurance. I want to create retirement income, but I want to use as little of my money as I possibly can, right? Just like I would if I was purchasing a new property. So in this specific um, strategy, that we call Velocity Plus, it's going to be a three to one leverage ratio. Now we make this a super, a really safe um, version of premium finance in the sense that what we're going to do is in the early, the first few years, we're going to break it up. We're going to fund, I'm going to fund half of it and the bank's going to fund the other half. So let's just use $100,000 to make things easy. I put in my 50,000, they put in their 50,000. I do that for another, uh, for five years. And then at that point, the bank is going to take over and pay the entirety of that 100000 for the next five years. So now we have 10 total years. I've put in 250000 The bank's put in 750000 And now I have a chance to take advantage of this incredible leverage. And, and again, utilizing it with life insurance is critical because we're building the policy really the same way that we do it with wealth formula banking, right? We're going to have maximum, maximum cash minimum cost so that when we take that leverage, we can create an arbitrage between the interest paid back to the bank and the interest earned. So the key to the success of the strategy is to earn a greater return than I have to pay. Um, and, and what's happened is, is that we have this historical precedent of being able to do this really in a variety of different economic situations. And we'll talk a little bit about no. some of the testing we do. On that yeah. Why don't we talk about that now? Because that goes into, again, now people are saying, well, gosh, I mean, now we're talking about market exposure again, and I'm sitting here and I just lost, you know, um, you know, 25, 30% of my portfolio in a matter of two weeks. Uh, do I really want exposure? And what is, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, first of all, you look. You, we have this thing where you know, you, you there is a floor to this kind of thing, right? But then you do have a little bit of leverage. You added a little, little bit of risk on top of that because, I mean, listen, if you had ten negative years in a row, you you know, you were not going to make any money here, right? But the uh, the likelihood of that is extremely small historically. And tell us about the stress tests 
that you've done that have included some of the worst financial times in America and how those came out? Yeah. So, yeah, the stress tests are critical. And what we found is that there, uh, surprisingly, there are a few advisors out there who are in, you know, involved in premium finance type of uh, policies that even do it. And, and that's, it just feels like that's, we have to know, right. It would be great if we could just, just uh, get, you know, what's been happening in the last 10 years, well, prior, prior to the last week, right, where, where interest rates are low and, and the market's going great. But the fact is that we do have times where it's bad. So what we wanted to do is pick the worst economic time frames in, in two ways. Number one is the market, so going back to the Great Depression. And number two, for interest rates, because now we have a loan involved in the process, and if interest rates are going up, we're going to pay higher interest, and so we need to understand what, what the impact is of that. So first, let's start with the Great Depression. So uh, the reason why the Great Depression is, is the place to go is not just because of the, the pure volume that it lost, but it was over an extended period of time. So, uh, you know, five straight years, nine out of 12 years where the market was flat or down. And so in this particular case with the IUL, we wouldn't have earned any interest in those years. And so what, what impact does that have on our, on our strategy? Um, and so what we do, and when, when we do this, we're, we're, like Christian said, we're kind of projecting out and saying this, this ultimately is leading toward a, a certain amount of retirement income in the future. We take our baseline retirement income and then we superimpose the Great Depression on that same scenario, then we end up with about 65% of the income that we otherwise would have gotten based on our, our you know, baseline. So uh, ultimately what that tells me is that the, and, and really the, it's these types of stress tests that ultimately uh, drove the design and the, and the ratio of how much we're putting out of pocket versus how much we're loaning because it just needs to be a, a design that is successful um, so that even in a Great Depression scenario, mm. we still come out and we're good, right? So so just uh, to be clear, 65%. 65% of what? So if my, if my baseline projected income, let's say it's 100,000, let's say the, you know, the example Christian gave, I put in 50,000 a year, finance the other, so uh, over the 10 years, I would have put in 250. The bank would have put in 750. And then let's project to uh, age 65, and now we're turning that into a stream of income. Let's say the income was $100,000 a year for the rest of my life, okay, uh, on, the, on just our baseline projections. Then in a Great Depression scenario, the, the income would be about 65000 a year. So not bad, even in, like, you know, arguably the worst uh, right. worst period in American history. Uh, you still seven exactly. straight years. Yeah, yeah, you yeah st- there's seven straight years of negative, and they were right at the beginning, right? So right. that's why one of the reasons we feel so comfortable with the design is because, you know, we've never seen anything like that. And even if we did, for somebody who is willing and prepared to to go in it for longer term, it's gonna it'll recover over time, right? And it'll do the trick. And so from that standpoint, um, we have a we have a lot of safety nets. And then, of course, there's things that we can do to mitigate risks in other ways, right? So we sometimes talk about it like it's, uh, you know, you do it and then it's done. Uh, but in reality, you know, we meet with everybody regularly and make adjustments where we need to. But ultimately, uh, the strategy has been so successful over that time frame if the policy design is done correctly. Right. And that's, and that's critical. By the way, um, I should just point out that some of you uh, may go out to your insurance broker and say, hey, I just heard this cool stuff. Tell me about it. And I can tell you from personal experience that most of the time they're just going to look at you and say, yeah, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Or yeah, we have something kind of like that. And neither one of those uh, is is actually a good, uh, good thing. Um, most of this is a product. These products are not something that most, most real uh, insurance brokers have any clue about or have any access to do. This is a really specialized product. Um, and, you know, Rod and Christian are the guys I trust with this. So before we um, cut this um, uh, this talk off here for today, I want to just touch on one more thing. Because we borrowed this Velocity Plus concept from the Ultra High Net Worth. And 
we have people in our, you know, group that are really are, you know, ultra high net worth. I mean, uh, you know, net worth of over 20 million bucks, or maybe they're making, you know, even like making a million and a half, $2 million a year. Uh, in those situations, they may qualify for a more traditional uh, premium finance IUL. So tell us how that's different from Velocity Plus and, and who qualifies. Yeah, so to begin with, uh, with the traditional kind of this, this model we were just talking about, uh, qualification is, is really anyone who has a strong six-figure income. Okay, we can, we can uh, get them into one of those uh, Velocity Plus policies. So now when we're taking that to that next level, then more based on net worth and, you know, anyone who's above, say, three to five million uh, in net worth uh, can then start to look at this kind of next level where we're, we're purely uh, custom building the, the strategy. And in this case, so in, on, the, on this original Velocity Plus uh, scenario we're talking about, we don't have to come up with, out, with any kind of outside collateral. The policy itself covers all the collateral on the loan that we need. In this other design, uh, we can custom build it, and and so ultimately, by uh, bringing in some additional outside collateral, maybe something that's invested in bonds or or you know the market or cash or you know some sort of liquid uh, position, then uh, it stays where it is and it continues to do its thing. But now we can use it as collateral by doing that then we can, we can bring in additional leverage. So if three to one was our, our ratio on this uh, design we talked about a minute ago, then we can get, we can go all the way up to 100% leverage, right? Um, usually we're, we're doing it you know, where there's some out of pocket, but, but ultimately you know, the, the balancing factor on that is, is what the person can come up with with outside collateral, then, then we can just go to town and, and really match the, the amount of leverage to the individual in their situation. Just to just to put that into context again, now we're talking about, you know, nine to one infinite, potentially infinite leverage. Um, I don't know if I would do myself an infinite leverage thing, but would I do nine to one? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I I think the the thing that you have to understand is um right now, and the reason I bring this up is because for both for velocity plus and for this premium finance thing. It's probably, you're not going to find probably a better time to start this kind of thing than right now, because that is, if you believe one year from now, uh, we won't be better off than we are today. And personally, I do think because of the nature of what we're going through, that it is a, um, I'm not saying it's be short lived, but I think it's a punch in the gut and we know where that punch is coming from. It's a virus. A year from now, uh, the markets, are, we're going to figure out what to do about this. There'll probably be vaccinations. People will be back to work. The market, almost guaranteed, will be in a better place next year than it is in the next couple of months here. So if you're going to start in a down year, basically, and say, okay, I want to index starting now to next year, now is potentially the best time to do it. Um but yeah, so in the scenario where you're using that higher leverage, do you have any sort of numbers like what kind of, you know, what kind of returns, you know, are on that kind of pro forma? So, um, you know, that's a great question, Buck. We, in, in that webinar that we did on specifically on Velocity Plus, we used pretty conservative numbers and ended up at um, just over 18% as a um, return. And that was in the three to one leverage version. So, so we haven't necessarily, we probably should do another example that creates that. But what I can say is that it would certainly start moving into the 20 plus percent. And, and again, if you can do that on a relatively consistent basis while getting some of those other benefits, like, it, you know, for the right people, it's a no brainer. I just tell people retained capital is the key, right? Especially for investors like, you know, you've got people, you've got a ton of really savvy investors listening who can go out and generate great returns. Well, all we're going to do here is we're going to continue to generate great returns in just a different way. Um, and, it, and But it's consistent with the way that they're, the philosophy that people are using. Yeah. And bottom line is, I mean, that's a product that, you know, 
a lot of my ultra high net worth friends, colleagues use. Uh, if you fall into that category, uh, it's definitely something to look into and talk to Christian and Rod about. Now, um, you know, if you're wondering why, uh, you know, if you're if you're sitting there listening to me thinking, gosh, he really likes this, these kinds of products. I do. I really do. I'm a believer in them. I'm a user of these products. And um, right now I'm thinking to myself, you know, if you're sitting at home and you've been thinking about this kind of stuff, uh, I want to remind you, like if you had a bunch of money sitting in banking right now or, you know, uh, you, you you wouldn't really be worried about anything. And if you had a an index product right now, you'd be like, okay, well, I zeroed out. At least I haven't lost 30% of my money, right? And if I do anything throughout this period, I want you to look at this stuff because these are products that help will help you sleep better at night. Um, to that effect, I want to point out a couple things. First of all, you can learn a lot more about everything we're talking, well, specifically about Wealth Formula Banking and Velocity Plus by going to wealthformulabanking.com and watching the webinars with Christian and Rod. And um, you can also reach out to them via that um, that website. Again, it's wealthformulabanking.com. The other thing is, I am so, uh, you know, I, I really i am so dedicated right now to this concept of providing you this, more information on this, that what I've asked Christian and Rod to do is actually have a webinar. We'll go over some basic, you know, numbers, uh, examples, but then the rest of the time we're going to use it for Q&A. I want to use it for Q&A, and I want you to come with your questions, and they're going to do basically, you know, just, uh, just uh, a few, you know, numbers that you can see on the screen in a webinar. And the rest of the time we're going to use for questions and get them answered. Because if you're sitting at home, now is the time to learn this stuff. And if you're interested, put it into place. I mean, just imagine this kind of thing, this sort of, you know, we got these black swan events. It won't be the last one you live through. I guarantee it. And the next one you want to feel better about, you know, than you do right now. Um, and that's just the way it always works. You just wish I had this done that. And this is one of those things I think could help you. So again, um, Thursday, um, Thursday is going to be when we do that. Uh, that is, uh, I'll send an email about it, but the date of that is Thursday, the 26th, and that will be at 5.30 central time. And if you have not gotten an email about it, shoot me an email at buck at wealthformula.com. But you almost certainly should have an email if you're already on my list uh, for that. Uh, Christian, Rod, do you guys have anything else to say before we get off? I was just going to mention, Buck, that uh, we are going to put out some literature between now and then. Um, I think you were planning on releasing yep. it before the before we actually got into the Q&A. Yep. Um, and that will be good for anybody that's going to be there. Check it out. Come with your questions. See if you can stump us. Great. Well, great, guys. Thanks again for your time. And uh, again, hopefully people will reach out, wealthformulabanking.com. And uh, uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Right now, I really can't think of anything better to focus your investing on uh, than these kinds of products, honestly. It really, I have to tell you, I mean, there could be some really good buying opportunities and real estate coming up, et cetera, but it's going to take a few months and there's no reason why you can't do both because you can get your money into something like this and then borrow it back and use it for that and double dip. Listen, if you have money in the market or anything else correlated right now, you're not feeling that comfortable. I understand that. The reality is we have listeners that do nothing but wealth formula banking, and that's the truth. And they've made the decision in their lives that they're done with this kind of you know emotional market fluctuations and all this. They want consistency the way that those who lived through the Great Depression, they all did too, right? They, they all had, you know, that was a generation where everyone just had cash or permanent life insurance. That's it. And that tells you something, right? Now, um, I did send you out some papers uh, for you to look at as well, but also 
Remember, there are some webinars for you to look at at wealthformulabanking.com. And I highly encourage you to do that before Thursday and come and listen to our webinars because this is a, a real opportunity uh, you know, to, to get your questions answered and figure out if this is right for you. Maybe it's not. But listen, if you if you don't understand it, then I haven't done that service for you. So I highly encourage it. That's it for me this week. Uh, hopefully next week I'll have some, you know, I'll feel more optimistic. Uh, this is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.